Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. June, June is here, and classrooms across Canada and the U.S. are starting to go out on their summer breaks. Uh, this school year has just flown by. We've hosted hundreds and hundreds of live events with tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of students across North America and beyond. So June's always one of my favorite months as a diver. Uh, I love getting into our ocean uh, and exploring what you can find beneath the waves. So last week was World Ocean Week. World Ocean Day was on June 8th. So last week I was in New York at the Explorers Club uh, and we hosted a whole series of live events all week long celebrating the ocean. It was a ton of fun. If you want to check out any of those events this week or as the school year is coming to an end, head to exploringbytheseat.com backslash ocean week and you can find all of those events. Now, we still have a few more events coming up before the end of the school year, just exploringbytheseat.com. In general, you can find some of those events. will be some virtual field trips like World Giraffe Day at the Toronto Zoo and then on board the Exploration Vessel Nautilus uh, towards the end of the month as well. But we're keeping that ocean theme going with our event today. Today, I'm really excited to have Emily Novacek joining us. She is a marine biologist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. She's based in St. John's, Newfoundland. Her background is in seafloor mapping and habitat modeling to support marine conservation. So she's currently leading a tagging and te te telemetry uh, research program tracking the movements, behavior, and survival of species like Atlantic cod, Greenland halibut, uh, and the witch flounder. So I'm going to bring Emily in live with us right now. Hi, Emily. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. It's great to have you live with us. We have a great group of classrooms joining us uh, on camera, another even larger group hanging out via YouTube Live. Uh, and so we're excited to dive into your work and then uh, we'll let the students take over for a bit. Okay, sounds great. Awesome. I'm gonna tuck myself away and the floor is yours, Emily. Okay, cool. Uh, so, hey guys, I'm Emily and uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a few of my favorite projects that I've worked on over the last 10 years, which feels crazy to say. Uh, but um, looking at different different projects where I've really looked at like mapping the marine habitats or mapping the movement of marine animals um, and all of that building into uh, conservation planning or resource management. And I'll give you just like a ton of examples as we go. Um, but that's generally what I do is I make maps underwater, which uh, can be quite challenging. You'll see. <laughs> uh, so I got started in all of this um, working for a marine protected area in Colombia the seafloor marine protected area. Um, so that's around a couple of islands in the uh, Caribbean part of the country of Colombia, but actually closer to Nicaragua, if anybody is really into geography. Um, and I went there just super excited to dive on coral reefs, to work with fish, um, to live in a new country, all of that. Um, and I left super excited about maps. So what we were doing primarily there was uh, looking at um, marine tourism, so all the different activities that happen in the MPA and how they were impacting the reef or not. Um, and we were building the first maps of coral health for the MPA. Um, and it was just super interesting to see how, how much you need maps as a management tool. So to understand where all the dive boats are going, where all the other tour boats are going, where the jet skis are going, and then where do we see actual damage on our reefs um, that helps them decide, you know, where do they put out new education programs for the MPA? Or should they redistribute enforcement officers or are the zones of the MPA like in the right spaces or covering enough area and all of this and every one of those questions just goes back to where are the human activities happening where are the habitats that we're trying to protect and how are those interacting in space the other thing I got to do uh, working on that project was uh, work with the coral nursery and transplanting endangered uh, staghorn coral back onto the reef uh, which is super fun. So we would pick up fragments of coral that were broken off by boats that had run aground or by say a novice diver who kicked a reef. Um, we would go and scoop up all those broken fragments, take them to the nursery, grow them a little bit bigger, a little bit healthier, and then plant them back out onto the reef. And this again, super reliant on good maps. So you wanna know where are the conditions the best for the nursery? Where are the habitats where we can plant out into and expect success? So we really need good habitat maps to inform that. Um, and then maps of where we planted corals so we can keep track of them over time and look at their growth. So again, like I just went there for the fish and I left super, super jazzed on maps, mapping and, and contributing to conservation planning through spatial tools. Um, 
so uh, finished up that project. Oh, there's just another picture of some brain coral. I just love being on the reef. Um, finished up that project, was really jazzed on maps, and ended up uh, going to graduate school for marine habitat mapping. And one of the projects that I was super lucky enough to work as a research assistant on was one mapping habitats in uh, Kikitarjuak in Nunavut, so northern Canada. So totally, totally different um, part of the world, totally different habitats um, and different species that we're looking at. Uh, so there's a polar bear that was out when we were out in the field one day. So in this case, we weren't just um, scuba diving and recording positions from a boat, from, you know, with divers and with a flag to a boat. We were actually using multi-beam echo sounding data. So this is the way that um, most of the large scale seafloor mapping is done. Um, and if you can imagine, if you're going to map some, a habitat on land, you're probably going to use like a GPS. GPS signal can't, can't trans, uh, transfer through water. So that's out. Um, if you're in shallow water, like where we were in the, in the coral reef in my last slides, we would scuba dive and have a flag to the surface and a boat would come and follow us and record positions. Um, and that's how we tracked all the positions of where we planted the coral and where the good um, habitats were the damaged reefs. If you're working on a much bigger scale or in deeper water, you can't do that. Um, and so what we use is sound. So multi-beam echo sounding, you'll have a transducer on the hull of a boat. It's gonna send uh, pings, sound waves down, bounce them off the seafloor and measure their return. And so how long it takes for those sound waves to come back uh, to the boat tells you the depth of the water. Um, how strong they come back can tell you something about what the seafloor is made up of. So if you get, if you're on really rocky habitat, you'll get a really efficient echo, you'll get a strong echo back. If you're on sandy, muddy habitat, you can imagine that those soft substrates will absorb some of the sound waves. You're not gonna get as strong an echo back. So you can also start to figure out more about what the seafloor is made up of. And the angle of those returning echoes can tell you about the shape of the seafloor. So you're just bouncing sound like a kind of like a bat echo locating, um, but you can actually pull a lot of information about the seafloor out of that. And it's the best way to get information about what's happening on the seafloor because, you know, light doesn't penetrate very deep and we can't <laughs> send GPS signal through there. Um, so we do a lot, a lot of this research with sound. And I'll, show, I'll talk some more about some other ways we use sound in marine research at the end. So. For this work they're doing in Kikatarjuak, uh, the big boat had already gone through and collected all the, all the multi-beam echo sanding. So they had the, the basic map of the seafloor. We were there to go in person and do some direct sampling to see, you know, when it's this deep and this slope, what's actually living there. So we were looking for the animals. And we weren't doing it from a very big boat. We were doing it from this freighter canoe. We were there for five weeks working off of this freighter canoe by days in this fjord. So this was August. This was August and the first week of September that we were there. The fjords were packed with sea ice. There were, those are four icebergs in the fjord right there. There were more icebergs like around the corner. Um, it was really, really gorgeous and, uh, and tough to get through <laughs> in a freighter canoe, you can probably um, imagine. We were also, because we're working from a freighter canoe, we were hauling all of our samples by hand. So we'd send down basically like a claw machine, claw off of that little, wooden um, arm you can see there, send it down, it hits the seafloor, a little spring triggers, it takes a scoop of what's there, and then we had to haul it back up by hand. Um, and then we would, you know, wash it through a little sieve, see what little organisms, so sea stars, urchins, um, crabs, all kinds of things, lots of little polychaetes, interesting little worms, um, and specifically clams. We were, in this case, we were really interested in the clam species. Um, so we'd sip out that sample. We also had a drop camera. So a camera on a long cable that we'd send off the side of our freighter canoe. Um, and the last kind of sampling we were doing on that trip was scuba diving. So it was uh, often below zero water. So short dives, but I have a little video that I'll show you what that looked like. So that's Manistee. That's another one of the research assistants who's with us. Um, and that's myself and uh, Ben Misiuk, who is leading this work. And you can see, you'll see Jonah. Jonah Kyokta was our skipper, so he's in the back there. Um, so when you're diving in Arctic water, most of the day is just getting dressed. <laughs> you have to wear a lot, a lot of gear to do this safely. Um, and then the rest of your day is spent trying to warm up again afterwards. <laughs> And so we're going to drop into the water here in a second, then I'll be able to show you what we were looking for. So 
So there's your scuba signal that you're A-OK. -okay. Um, so we were never over so under solid ice, but there was lots of sea ice around where we were diving, so again, very, very cold. Um, and we were looking for uh, Maya clams. So it's a species of clam that is present in um, intertidal zones in some of these northern communities. So people will go out and pick them up, like go clam digging. Um, but in this particular community, because it's on the fjord, there's no, there's no intertidal flats. It drops down into immediately quite deep water. Um, and so we were looking at where are the clam habitats that might support a sustainable harvest um, for scuba divers in the community to contribute to food security uh, for them. And I think if we go back here, is that slide gonna move for me? Come on. <laughs> there we go. Um, and so this is what those maps look like. So this is Ben's work. You can see that top left-hand corner is um, that the seafloor depth. So that first slide I showed you of bouncing the sound off the seafloor. This is what they got back for depth in those fjords. Um, the map below it is backscatter, so that's telling you how hard or soft the substrate is. And then on the right, there are the maps he put together of um, habitat suitability for these clams. And so the idea with that project was to look at how much habitat is there to support the species? What kind of um, sustainable harvest could we put together, um, funded and supported for that community? And there's Jonah out on the ice. This was one day when the sea ice came in while we were working. <laughs> and I asked Jonah if we were gonna get trapped out there and he said, oh, we'll just walk home. If we can't get the boat home, we'll walk home. Um, and now we're gonna come back to, or down, South again, a little bit south from there, uh, to Newfoundland and Labrador, which is where I live now. And I'll talk a bit about one more research project um, I worked on, and then I'll talk a little bit about my job now. Uh, so I originally came to Newfoundland to work on uh, a study on wolffish. So we have three species of wolffish here in Newfoundland waters. Um, so in order there, you've got the Atlantic wolffish, is your blue guy there, a spotted wolffish is one with spots, very creatively named. Um, and the big guy on the end is a northern wolffish. So uh, those two wolffish that we have out of water, um, don't worry about them. They were measured, weighed. Um, the big guy was tagged, actually, and then they were returned to the water. Uh, and they are just a very, very cool fish. So all three of these species are protected by Canada's Species at Risk Act right now. And part of the Species at Risk Act requires us to um, identify core habitat for the species that are protected so that we can protect their habitat and thereby help that species um, succeed in the long term. Um, so I came down for a habitat mapping project. Um, and same thing, so we were using that multi beam echo sounding data that I showed you before, bouncing sound off the seafloor to learn about it. And then we go in and do some ground truthing. So the actual physical sampling to see what is there in the habitats. So there's the big claw I was telling you about where we get our um, grab samples. Um, and then again, we were doing drop camera work. So sending a camera off the side of the boat and scuba diving. Common theme in my research, I dive as much as I can. Um, and so this is just a quick example of what it looks like when you find this wolfish denning habitat. These are Atlantic wolfish in this case, so the blue ones. Um, so they they uh, like to hide out in, in cracks and crevices, caves. Um, so you can imagine it's that's helpful for if you're trying to map habitat because we know that we need hard substrate. So strong echoes from that multi-beam echo sounding. We need high, high slope in order to make, you know, basically a 90 degree uh, flat surface for to form those caves. Um, but what was really interesting about this project is that it made me think about habitat not just in two dimensions like you would on a map and not just in three dimensions if you're also imagining water depth on top of on top of that, but actually in four dimensions because it's also based in time. It changes throughout the season. So the wolfish will travel inshore, offshore, depending on the temperatures, um, depending on their prey and uh, in order to reproduce. And they are, oh, it's moving too fast now. It's moving on its own. Um, so these are really cold water species. They thrive at just four degrees Celsius. And so in the summers and the early fall, when the water starts to get a lot warmer inshore, um, the wolfish will clear out. So that's what this graph is showing you. Um, don't worry about it too much, but basically what I want to show you is this part right here. So when that sea surface temperature gets up to 15, these are the detections we have of tagged wolfish in that area, and they all cleared out, um, which is not good because we're looking at thinning habitat where they need to be in the late summer, early fall to be reproducing. Um, 
and laying their eggs. And when the water gets too warm, that means that that habitat is no longer accessible to them. So there's a, a, a timing mismatch between when they need to be in their dens um, spawning and when those dens, these inshore dens are actually available to them. If it gets too hot, they can't use them. Um, even over 12 degrees, the eggs start to have abnormalities. They don't develop properly. Um, and so that led into the last project I'll talk about, uh, which is looking at, so if they can't use those inshore, those shallow habitats to reproduce because the water is getting too warm, um, where else can we find these fish? Where else can they be uh, living and reproducing and using that kind of denning, high slope, really important critical habitat? Um, and for that, we needed to map a much bigger area and we needed to map a much less accessible area. So basically we're looking at the entire offshore Newfoundland and Labrador shelf. It's uh, the study area for this project was uh, over 670, 100,000 kilometers. Um, and so this is uh, a project that I worked on that was totally at a computer. So all my other work before this was really, really field-based and that was how I got interested in it. Um, but as we got into bigger and bigger study areas and more complex questions, um, we get into like just straight up computer modeling to create these maps. Um, and so in this case, we were looking at such a large area that there's no way that any one boat could go out and survey that whole area to get us multi-beam. So this is actually um, depth data that is collected by thousands of fishing vessels all the time. So they're collecting their own depth soundings to inform their fishing. So they know like how do you set their gear? Um, what are they looking at? What kind of habitats? There's a crowdsourcing project. We took hundreds of, actually hundreds of millions of depth records from thousands of fishing boats collected over a decade and then modeled that data all together to create a map. And so this top row was the best bathymetry available before we worked on this project. And then this is what we were able to do with the crowdsource data. So it was super exciting stuff um, in terms of getting a better picture of what the seafloor looks over a huge area. And then the part that I'm really interested in is, so then what fish live there? And what are they doing while they're there? Um, a side benefit to that work, which was not one that I thought we were gonna do, was that we were able to also find a whole bunch of, like hundreds of previously unmapped um, submarine canyons at the shelf edge. Um, and you can see again, so there is newer, Jeb, if anybody is super into bathymetry, there's newer Jebco now, but uh, at the time when I worked on this, the 2014 Jebco grid was the only available bathymetry for most of this area. And then on the right here, you have the crowdsource data that we put together. Um, so you can see how there's lots of these super complex little networks of uh, relatively small canyons, as far as canyons go. Um, they're still, you know, several kilometers across, <laughs> but small for canyons. Um, there's tons of them that were just not able to be resolved because the, the data was uh, too coarse. Um, so we're able to find hundreds of those canyons. And that's really interesting for not just marine habitats, which is what I care about, but also things like um, looking at submarine slope failures and marine hazards and where do we lay undersea cables, which is how, you know, the world's internet is, is put together. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try to move through this quick because I feel like I'm taking too much time. Uh, but uh, once we have that bathymetry, we can then pull out all this other information. So the slope of the seafloor, the different shapes, um, the landforms that are made up of it. And that also helps us understand habitats, the kind of substrate that's there. So whether it's mud, gravel, sand is super important to what animals will live there. Um, it's very hard information to get over such a large area. So we're really excited with this modeling. Um, and then all of that feeds into understanding where fish are. And that's what I do now. So now I work for um, the government of Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, specifically on tag unit telemetry. So uh, not just looking at where habitat is, but tracking individual fish, which is super exciting. And we have a few different tagging programs. Uh, the main one is the Atlantic Cod Tagging Program that's been going on since the 90s. Um, and we use a couple different kinds of tag. The main, the one that we use the most is a mark recapture. So every fish gets an individual, it's like a name tag. And whenever somebody catches that fish, they get a reward for telling us, you know, for sending us back in that tag and saying where they caught that fish, how long it was. Um, so then we get to know how long did that fish live after we tagged it? How much did it grow? And where did it go in that time? And that all feeds into stock assessment models so we can understand natural mortality and compare that to how many fish are being taken out by a fishery. It also helps us understand how the fisheries are interacting. So 
there's a recreational fishery in Newfoundland and there's a commercial fishery. Um, and this is one way that we can get an estimate on like that recreational fishery, how many fish are actually being taken out of the water. Um, and these are just a couple pictures of what the tagging process looks like. It looks like a little pricing gun. <laughs> if anybody um, has ever worked in retail, it's pretty similar. It's very easy to do. And here's a fish being released after we tag them. This is an Atlantic cod. Beautiful. Perfect. Gone. That's what you want is a quick swim away. That's a healthy fish that's going to go on and live for another, you know, hopefully five, six, ten years. And then we'll catch it again when it's much bigger and we'll find out a little bit about where it went. Um, the other tagging programs use some more interesting tag technology. So you can see this is a witch flounder, so a flatfish, and it's wearing an external tag. So that is actually an acoustic transmitter. I have one right here too. So this is one of the bigger ones we use. We also have for small fish, really tiny ones. <laughs> um, and so what those acoustic transmitters do, again, we're using sound. See, I told you we come back to sound. Um, they emit a unique ping like, so there's an acoustic identifier for each fish. So instead of having their name tag written on them with like the marker capture tags do, the acoustic tags are spitting out a unique ping, a unique sound uh, combination for each fish. And then we have sitting on the seafloor, uh, these guys, these are receivers that will record each individual fish that swims by within range um, and when they swim by. And then we have a few we have a few tags that do extra things. So they'll record the depth that the fish has been at, the temperature the fish has been at. We have some new ones that uh, record um, when a fish has been eaten. So we put them out. Actually, that's what this small one is. It's a predation detection tag. So it has a little bio enamel switch. I put it out in a small cod. If that cod gets eaten by anything, uh, that bio enamel switch will be triggered by the digestive enzymes in the stomach of the predator. Then the ping changes. So if the predator swims by um, one of our receivers, It'll get the identity, the identity of that fish and an additional little ping that says, but that fish was eaten, <laughs> um, which is really interesting in terms of looking at um, how, what are the predation rates on these fish. So again, natural mortality compared to fishing mortality is all very important when you're um, trying to manage a fish stock sustainably. Um, and that's uh, just a little diagram of basically you've got a cod, it's got a transmitter inside, and that signal is being picked up by these receivers. And we have a lot of them off of the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, mostly Newfoundland. Um, all those orange ones are offshore receivers uh, in up to 750 meters of water. There's 77 of those, 78. And then inshore, all these black dots are run by my program. Um, so we have about 100 inshore receivers. And then the other colors are other programs, but they're all compatible with each other. So if anyone's fish swims by anyone else's receiver, they're all on the same um, frequency. So we can then share data and, and get an even broader coverage. So we also, we have collaborators up in the Arctic because some of our fish are uh, Greenland halibut. will swim across the Atlantic to Greenland and up to the Canadian Arctic. So we have partners with receivers in all those places. That's a Greenland halibut. Um, so new just this year, we also started putting out some satellite tags. So in that case, I don't even need the fish to swim up to a receiver. Um, I have a date programmed into that satellite tag. The tag will pop off at the program date, float to the surface, send the data up to the satellite, and then I will be able to see what depths that fish has visited, what temperatures that fish has been in, um, and it's starting an endpoint. So again, no GPS through water. So I just get the location where it was tagged and location where it surfaced, um, but we also get the temperature and depth data in between. And that's it for me. So now let's do some questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Emily, for that great presentation. Uh, and the really cool work you get to do in the ocean. I know I've, you always hear about tags that can, you know, tell you where a fish is, how deep they go, temperature, water, and things like that. But a tag that shows when they've be, been eaten, that's pretty darn cool too. Yeah, that's new. And we are super stoked about it. I cannot wait to get some data back on those. <laughs> All right. Well, look, before we go to uh, some Q&A action, uh, I pulled together a quick little Kahoot quiz in the background while you were presenting. So we like to do little Kahoot quizzes here and get the classrooms interacting, see who comes out on top. <laughs> so I'm going to share a link here, Kahoot.it. If you head over there right now uh, in your classroom, it's going to ask you for a PIN number. I'm going to share my screen uh, and that PIN number is going to come up front and center. If you have one-to-one -one technology at your desks, uh, you can join in from there. If not, maybe your teacher can put it up at the front of the room. You can shout out 
uh, your answers to the question. So here we go. Let me share my screen. Let's bring this Kahoot front and center. There we go. So your pin number is coming up now. It is 299-4663. Uh, there's also a QR code there. If you have a mobile device or a tablet, you could scan the code uh, and it should pop up right on your phone. I can see our first student or classroom has joined. Here comes some more. So uh, four questions today. There is some true and false, some multiple choice. 20 seconds for each question. If you get it right, you're getting some points. If you get it right and you do it quickly, you get even more points. If you get it wrong, but you got it wrong really, really fast, well, it doesn't make a difference. No points. You got to get it right uh, and as quickly as you can. So although the names are preloaded by Kahoot, there's some pretty good ones coming in here, like the adorable Ibex, the Swift Giraffe, the Sturdy Frog, the Epic Hamster. Are we still have students and groups coming in, so I'm going to give it another few more seconds uh, to get everybody squared away. So Emily, if you had to break down a percentage, how much of your work do you find is in the field compared to maybe looking at data uh, and stuff in the lab? It's probably like one quarter, maybe best case, one quarter field, three quarters lab. But uh, on Wednesday, so in two days, I go to sea for two weeks, actually. All right. Lucky we saved you before that. Okay. I think our sign-ins are slowing down. So let's get into the Kahoot action because we want to make sure we have uh, lots of time for some Q&A. So here we go. Three seconds to the first question. So I hope you're paying attention. Right at the beginning, Emily talked about the Seafloor <laughs> Marine Protected Area. Was that in Canada? Was that in Colombia? Was that in Cuba? Or was that in Ecuador? A big call back to the beginning. The first field work Emily talked about. A few more seconds on the clock. All right. Good job, crew. Most students ended up going with Columbia. Good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> that puts the knowing rabbit in first place, but things are close. Let's go to a little true and false action. Single beam sonar was used to map the sea floor. So single beam sonar was used to map the sea floor, and that uses sound. Single beam sonar. Is that true or false? A couple more seconds on the clock. Oh, all right. We tricked our crew. Good job to those who went false. We were tricky. I was very sneaky. We talked about multi beam <laughs> sonar. So, multi beam sonar uses a nice wide range of beams to map a bigger area of the sea floor. And also it can be helpful too, because things like bubbles and even marine life can, can have an impact. So if there's lots of different data points coming back, you can get uh, a bit better of a picture. So it was multi-beam sonar. Let's see what that little trick did to the board. That puts the majestic badger in first and we will jump into another multiple choice. So how many species of wolf fish are there in Newfoundland waters? Was it one, two, three, or four species in those cold Newfoundland waters? Got a few more seconds. All right, there we go. Back on track. Most students went with three. That was the purple pelican in first place. And now it all comes down to our last true and false question. Emily can use crowdsource data to make seafloor maps. A couple more seconds to get that answer in. All right. Good Wait. job, crew. We know that is true. Tons of data points. Sounds like, Emily, you were able to connect. Uh, or to collect and to get really uh, some good maps where you couldn't get that multi boom so sonar working for you, which just wasn't the right location. Okay, our podium. Third place, we have the Friendly Bison. In second place, we've got the Majestic Badger and holding down that top spot. 
to Purple Pelican. All right. Good job, crew. Thanks for playing along with us today. Let's kill that screen share. Turn off our Kahoot music. And let's change gears. If you're tuning in via YouTube, use that chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, send us in a question or two. Uh, for now, though, let's start swinging through some of our camera classrooms and let's start taking some of their questions. So we'll start off with Mrs. Deacon's crew. They are joining us from London, Ontario. Looks like some grade sevens. Let's bring her in there. Hey, Miss Deacon, how are you? Hi. Hi, Emily. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for um, bringing us underwater with you. I'm a diver as well, so I was like explaining oh, to my class all about the dry gear and stuff. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. Um, I, I have to say I felt kind of sad for these little fish to be swimming with things hanging off of them. Do you know anything? Like, does it hurt them? Are they uncomfortable? Does it impede their ability to swim? That is a great question. So there are studies on this. So you would typically do a lab study for any new kind of tag to make sure that it's not impeding growth and it's not impeding movement. So like you nailed it. Um, and so we have a couple of things that we do to try to maintain um, fish welfare. Uh, so the main one is that for most species, the best practice is to keep the weight of your tag um, below 2% of the total body weight of the fish in, measured in air. Um, and so that's why, you know, I was showing you the different sizes of tags. So this bigger one, this goes into a like an Atlantic cod that's at least 60 centimeters. So over half a meter long is the basic size for a fish getting this larger transmitter. These little ones can go into like a 30 or 40 centimeter cod. Um, so we're observing a pretty strict ratio of weight in terms of the total bulk of the tag on the fish. Um, there's also a few other things um, that we do. So for example, those witch flounder where you saw it had the external tag. So that attachment method is actually based on a study that looked at six different ways to attach um, a tag externally to a flatfish. Um, and it found that that one where it's a small T-barred tag and, and then attached to that is better than say, uh, like a more invasive attachment method that would still hold the tag outside. Um, but yes, there's tons of research on that, trying to make sure that when we're met tracking fish moving, we want them to be moving in natural behaviors and still growing and still eating. Um, so we do minimize the, the total effect of the tag on the fish for sure. I'm sure they don't enjoy being tagged though, because we do catch them, bring them to this tiny surgery, observe them to make sure they recover and then release them. So it is like being abducted by aliens for them, I'm sure. Uh, but all the research shows that they recover pretty quickly. All right. right. It's probably just a good story to tell around the school. <laughs> all right. Good stuff. Great question, Ms. Deacon's crew. Uh, where should we go now? Let's go to Miss O'Connor's crew in New Jersey. I'm going to bring them up front and center. There we go. Hey, Mrs. O'Connor, how are you? We're good. We have a question from Ryan. Excellent. He wants to know, Emily, how long have you been doing your job for? Uh, so this, biologist. Yeah, so this job now where I work for um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and do the fish tagging, I've just been here three years, so I still feel pretty new at it. Um, but I've been doing this kind of research for about 10 years, the, the C4 mapping especially. All right. Thank you, third graders, for that question. We'll try and swing back uh, and see if there's another one before we wrap up. We're going to take another little trip now. Where should we go this time? We need to go. We've got another crew with us here. They're in London as well. They are Miss Greenham's crew. I'm going to bring them in. There we go. Hey, London, how we doing? Okay, can you guys hear me? We yeah. gotcha. Okay, uh, yeah, we're actually in the same room, Miss Deacon and I, so it's kind of fun. We're teaching virtually together. Um, we have a few questions, but uh, we'll just stick with one. And one of them is, what is the rarest fish or maybe even item that you've seen while uh, underwater? Oh, that's such a fun question. Um, oh, I have a good answer. Okay. Um, I did during grad school spend um, a semester working in Australia and I was volunteering with, a, it was called the reef check survey. So like a, you volunteer and you help do reef surveys to collect information on biodiversity. And the woman who was leading my group had found a new species of frogfish, the red, red lipped frogfish had like just, um, recently been um, like named and, and uh, like identified as for sure a di distinct species from the other um, from the other fish. And uh, 
we got to see one of those and it, that was really cool. It was like a, just described like two years before I was there, I think. All right. Very, very cool. So uh, a few groups saying hi online. We've got the Terrific Threes from Toronto. We've got some great four fives from Ottawa. Looks like a virtual crew. So this is Miss Sullivan's class, and they're curious to know, how old would you have to be to have the job that you do? Um, <laughs> that's a fun question. I guess it depends uh, how much school you want to do. Um, so I am finishing up my PhD right now, um, which means I've been in school for about, been in university for about 10 years, <laughs> but I'm about to be finished. Um, but you do need, for the job I do, you do need to have... Um, at least a master's degree. So that's, you'd finish high school, you'd do probably three or four years of a bachelor and then another two years, but maybe two to four years of graduate school after that. Um, so high school plus eight years of school, give or take. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, let's see, Sterling, Ontario. We've got some grade sixes hanging out with us. Uh, oh no, they just disappeared. That's no good. Oh, no. Uh, okay, I'll grab another question from the Kahoot. Hopefully, they'll they'll be able to pop back in. But uh, right as they came in, their camera went off and they vanished. So, um, question about inspiration, Emily. Is there somebody, uh, someone, an educator, or another scientist that inspired you growing up, and maybe kickstarted <laughs> your love for the ocean? Yeah, um, my mom is also a marine biologist, and so we traveled a bit when I was a kid um, for her work. Um, so I got to, like, I learned to swim um, living in Indonesia and uh, snorkeling on the coral reef there. So um, that's probably a big part of it. I actually, when I first went into university, I didn't want to do marine biology like my mom. I actually started out in a philosophy program. Uh, but then I just really enjoyed my biology classes. It, the ocean clawed me back one way or another. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jacques Cousteau said something about once the ocean casts its net on you, uh, you know, it's wonder. It doesn't let go. So I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good example right there. Very cool. Uh, OK, well, let's open it up. If there is anything, uh, some more questions online, don't be shy. I can still see about lots of viewers tuning in. So send some of those into us. Uh, if you are still a camera classroom, just give me a wave or give me a quick message in the chat so we come back and visit your crew. In fact, I see Miss O'Connor's third graders have another question here. So let's let's bring Mrs. O'Connor in so she can rock that question. All right. We were wondering about the effects of ocean pollution. We 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 researched a lot about habitats and we thought pollution was a big issue. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so marine plastics are a huge issue, and the thing that we see most often in my work is um, abandoned fishing gear as the biggest source of marine pollution that we that we deal with. For this area because we have a ton of fishing around Newfoundland and Labrador um, and so that's that's a problem for a number of reasons so you have any plastic in the ocean um, is going to have negative effects you it degrades into microplastics it gets into food chains um, but abandoned fishing gear or lost fishing gear um, can also keep fishing so you have like nets or traps that you know get detached from the lines so the boat can't haul them in they can't find them again but they're sitting there on the seafloor still catching fish still trapping fish um, or crab or whatever species, um, which can be quite uh, quite destructive over the long term. Um, so I'd say abandoned fishing gear is what we run into in our work most, but um, certainly we do see um, multiple kinds of pollution. There's also offshore oil and gas um, industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, when when there is an issue with an oil and gas platform, it is, um, it's, really bad and worse even um, in acute effects than than marine plastics from the abandoned fishing gear. Um, luckily, I don't deal with that at all. Um, and those incidents are pretty rare. All right. I thought I would show this. I think the students will get a kick out of this. This skateboard here was made 100% of recycled fishing nets. Cool. So, oh, this was uh, a group Boreo in Chile. And so they encourage the fishermen to bring their nets to them uh, to be recycled uh, and then built into these totally recycled plastic uh, skateboards. They do other things too, like sunglasses and stuff, but I think the students would probably find the skateboard is uh, the most exciting out of that. So cool use for those discarded fish nets. 
Uh, Miss Deacon Screw sent me a big question in the chat, so I'm going to let uh, her pop in and feel free to fire that question away. Hi again. Uh, so we're really wondering about kind of the mechanics and uh, like your job, right? So what are some strange and unusual and best things that you've seen underwater? I, research or not related. Um, I guess some of the tricky stuff is what you just talked about too, about seeing all the pollution. It's quite sad, right? Um, but then I guess we're also thinking about uh, favorite memories and um, yeah, yeah, that's what we're, we're wondering about. Sure. Um, I've got a few, like any, any day you're in the water, you're going to see something um, amazing or even just uh, scuba diving. I look just everything kind of slows down and it's a little quieter, a whole different planet really under the water. Um, so any day in the water is good. Um, but there are some days that stand out. So there was a day when we were working on the wolfish habitat mapping project. So we were out, um, we were just on the little Zodiac. So a very small boat <clears throat> with a drop camera over the side. And, uh, this is in Newfoundland and a leatherback turtle came up beside the boat and he was almost as big as the Zodiac we were in. Like leatherback turtles are enormous and I had never seen one before. I've never seen one since, <laughs> but they do come through Newfoundland waters in the summer looking for jellyfish to eat. Um, so that was pretty incredible. And uh, just so chill, this turtle. He like surfaced beside us, he looked at us, kept swimming. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. I want to put that into perspective for the students who are tuning in because Leatherback Sea Turtles are the coolest. So um, <laughs> 2,000 pounds is how big a Leatherback Sea Turtle can be. Uh, it's like a small car. Like, they're so big. <laughs> absolutely amazing. Some people go back and forth, whether saltwater crocodiles are the biggest reptiles or Leatherback Sea Turtles. Uh, but that's that's pretty darn impressive. And to see one, that's really, really awesome. If you ever look up, if you have time, uh, classrooms, the inside of a mouth of a leatherback sea turtle. It looks like something from a horror movie uh, to kind of snag and hold on to those slippery jellyfish. You should definitely check that out. It's, it's quite something once you've seen it. Uh, online, we've got a question here from our students in Danforth Gardens. They would like to know what your favorite fish species is. Ooh, okay. So it changes all the time, but lately, um, Atlantic spiny lump sucker. I wonder if I can share my screen and show you a picture of an Atlantic spiny lump sucker. They're so cute. Okay, let me let me bring this up. So they're um, a really neat fish be for a couple of reasons. So there's a couple. Oh, uh -oh now I've lost my screen. It's just yeah because you're doing the multiple screens. But if you drag it over, yeah, I see it coming over. Perfect. Okay. Um, Atlantic, I need to have in there. I mean, I guess we could all be Googling on our own, but now we're Googling together. Well, we're here together, so why not? <laughs> so this, this, from a family of uh, lumpfish, where the, the fin on the bottom of their body has been adapted into a suction cup. And so you can see this one is suctioned into this person's hand. So they'll suction onto a little rock and then just stay there and sit and grab food out of the water and then when they do have to swim somewhere, oh boy, they do not swim well. They are so silly because they kind of wobble around in the water. They're not a very efficient swimmer at all. They don't swim far at a time. They'll just like suction cup on one rock, stay there for a bit and eat, and kind of wibble over to another rock and suction cup to that one and stay there too. They're so, so funny. And uh, when we catch them in our work, like they will suction cup to your hand and you'll have to like pull them off to release them back into the water. <laughs> All right, very cool. Well, if you get to play show and tell, I'm gonna share my screen for a second here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and show the students the inside of Leatherback Sea Turtle's mouth, because it's pretty wild. Wild. So imagine that's the last thing you see as a jellyfish. <laughs> well, jellyfish can't really see, so maybe sense. Uh, that's pretty wild. Okay. Uh, let's come back from that screen share. Let's go into, I know Miss O'Connor's crew just sent a question in the chat about coral reefs. So they're wondering if you uh, have had a chance to, to work in those environments at all. And are yeah, they in so, trouble? Yeah, so my first, my first big research project was in Columbia on the coral reefs there in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean are some of the world's most threatened coral reefs. Um, and it, that's mostly due to climate change. So we have 
increasingly warm waters, um, increases in ocean acidity. Um, and both of those things are really, really hard on corals. So, you know, corals, um, it's a symbiotic relationship. So you have this little zooanthellate that when the water gets too warm, it'll leave the coral. It'll spit. And that's how you get, you've probably, or maybe you've seen pictures of coral, coral bleaching. When the coral goes all white, it's because that little symbiote has popped out because it's gotten too stressed. And the, the main cause of that stress is rising temperatures. So when the water is too warm for too long, um, that symbiotic relationship breaks down um, and the coral will die. Um, that's the main threat to coral reefs. But um, like all marine habitats, fishing continues to be a threat. Um, marine pollution continues to be a threat. Uh, but climate change for coral reefs, climate change, it's a big one. Yeah. And absolutely. a really hard one to solve. That's absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, squeeze one more in here. This one came in online. Uh, and it's a question about aging fish. Is there a way to age fish? Oh, this is so great that we got this question because there is a way to age fish. And it's this on my earring is, ooh, is that going to focus? It's a tiny little bone from the ear of, uh, this one is from an Atlantic cod. So that's called an otolith. And so what we can do is um, for fish that we sample, so the most, for my program, we tag fish. So we'll catch a fish, we'll tag it, and we'll let it go. And then we'll like look at its growth over the years until it comes back to us. Some fish will take the fish and we'll sample it completely. So we'll take its stomach and look at what it's been eating. We'll take its otoliths and look at the age of that fish and compare it to the weight and the length of the fish um, and all this. And so when we're doing that kind of sampling, you'll take this little ear bone out of the fish um, and we slice it open and count the rings inside under a microscope like you're counting the rings in a tree. Um, and the older the fish gets, the trickier it is because the lines get closer and closer together. You run out of space. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff you can do. Yeah, looking at the way they set down calcium in these tiny little ear bones. And that gives you a pretty, for most species, a pretty accurate estimate of how old they are. All right, excellent. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to the classrooms who joined us today. Thank you for the YouTube crew. Thank you to our camera classrooms for all those great questions. Thank you for playing Kahoot with us. Lots of fun, always playing our Kahoot. Uh, and Emily, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a, obviously a big month for the ocean, uh, although every day should be ocean day, I think. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was such a pleasure to have you here sharing some of the research you're doing, uh, and yeah, really taking us into that world of exploring, uh, the deep sea tracking fish and, uh, crowdsourcing. I think that's so cool right now is students can go home and sign up for any number of, uh, citizen science projects from yeah. Yeah, clouds for NASA to, uh, counting walrus from space for WWF. I mean, there's so many cool uh, citizen science projects that students can get involved in right now and don't have to wait uh, until they're older. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks so much for having me. I love talking about this stuff. I could do it for forever. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Like I mentioned, a couple more virtual field trips coming up with Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Uh, and then World Giraffe Day at the Toronto Zoo. So stick with us till the end of the year. Uh, but for now, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, and thanks for all the great questions, guys. Thanks so much.